Welcome to online worship at All Saints Episcopal Church in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. We also have in-person worship services here at the church. If you've been worshiping with us online during the pandemic but have never been here, I invite you to come and join us during one of those services. We'd love to meet you. The schedule for those services can be found right on the front page of our website. Otherwise, though, you're welcome to continue joining us in this way. So let's begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of 2 Kings. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the fruit, first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus, says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He said it before them, They ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power, that the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. The Lord is faithful in all his words and merciful in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down the eyes of all who wait upon you, O Lord, and give them, and you give them their food due in due season. 
You open wide your hand and satisfy the needs of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving in all his works. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all who call upon him faithfully. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are we, what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that they had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Those of you who have been coming every week uh, this summer now must be noticing that the lectionary readings have 
locked into those episodes in the life of Jesus where he and the disciples cross back and forth over the Sea of Galilee, only to meet crowds of needy, hungry people at every turn in feeding them and healing them. The story of Jesus feeding 5,000 hungry people on the shores of the Sea of Galilee appears not only a lot in this summer's lectionary, but also in all four Gospels. Matthew and Mark even have uh, an additional similar story of Jesus feeding uh, 4,000 people. So we're told of Jesus feeding crowds miraculously six times. This is remarkable for there are only a handful of things about Jesus that we are told in all four Gospels. Obviously, Scripture thinks that Jesus feeding the crowds contains particularly significant truths for us. Christians have seen in this story a reenactment of God giving manna to the Israelites in the wilderness. We remember this story each time we break holy bread together in our weekly worship, and perhaps uh, even when we pray together, give us this day our daily bread. Because this story appears so often, we are almost too familiar with it. But as we look at it week after week, there is always more truth in it each time as we delve into one spiritual layer after another. One of the quirks of the three-year lectionary of assigned readings we follow is that it gives us five consecutive Sundays here to reflect upon Jesus as the bread of life. This is week one, and that is exactly what we shall do, beginning with, um, well, the outer layer, as it were. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 is a favorite in Sunday school. We teach it to small children, but do we know what it means? Immediately after the story, Mark po makes the point that the apostles did not understand what happened. We're told there that Jesus went into the hills to pray while the disciples got into a boat to go across the lake again. On the lake, they were unhappy because uh, the wind was blowing in the wrong direction and they were straining at the oars. When Jesus met them, they did not recognize him at first. And we're told that the reason they were unhappy and failed to recognize Christ was that they did not understand about the loaves of bread. John also follows his story of the feeding of the hungry uh, with a story of the disciples' distress while crossing the lake alone. I wonder what Jesus feeding the hungry has to do with the disciples' distress crossing the lake. If they would have understood the teaching of the loaves of bread, how would they have crossed the lake differently? Jesus spent the whole day teaching the crowds that he eventually fed. The answer to our question is likely uh, found in his teaching. We have a good idea of what he was saying that day. His famous Sermon on the Mount is a summary of Jesus' usual day-by-day -day teaching. In the version of it given by Luke, Jesus says, Blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be satisfied. And then he continues by saying, Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. The lesson of the loaves that the disciples did not understand was, How are the hungry blessed? This is a hard question because the answer of Jesus is the opposite of what we normally think. If I'm anywhere very long, I discover that I'm hungry. I don't even go on vacation without doing some advance work uh, to answer one of my most pressing questions. Do they have food there? You know, the place where I'm going. Well, what if there's no food? I guarantee you that if I'm you know, still um, you know, here uh, three hours from now without eating, I'll feel weak and grumpy. It's easy to think of hunger as an evil to be avoided. I spend plenty of time doing exactly that. But Jesus challenged us to understand how the hungry are blessed. 
One reason why we seek to avoid even the sensation of hunger may be that it communicates powerfully a message that we don't like. It's a nagging, daily reminder that we are mortal, that we are not God. God alone is all-sufficient, self-sufficient. God doesn't eat. We, however, have a daily pain in our flesh, reminding us that we are material creatures whose life depends on the good grace of God to continue and summer rain leading to a good harvest. This teaching that God is God and uh, we're not sounds like the most obvious thing in the world, but the Bible insists that this is a lesson that human beings continually refuse to allow to penetrate to the core of their self-understanding. Recall the original Old Testament manna story that appears near the beginning of the Bible. Just as soon as the Israelites are freed by God from their slave masters in Egypt, they complain that there is so little food outside of Egypt, well, that they want to die. The complaint matters in the Bible because in its essence, it amounts to rejecting the gift from God that one has done nothing to earn. The Israelites wanted a world where they were not only freed from slavery, but also well-fed. They could imagine a better world than the one God gave them, and they sat in judgment of the world and God. Manna was not enough. I kind of feel like this a lot. The world has problems, and I have some uh, really good ideas that apparently God hasn't thought of yet. I judge God as falling short of my own standards. The disciples following Jesus around the lake aren't much different from the newly freed, complaining ancient Israelites. For example, the disciples go across the lake and are unhappy because the wind is making their life more difficult by blowing in the wrong direction. They're so disturbed by this that they do not recognize Jesus when he comes to them. They wanted the wind to blow the direction they were going. I'm sure that the people crossing the lake in their boats going the other direction probably thought it was a great day. All of them wanted their own wind. Does this situation not sound, you know, familiar? How often do I complain about the stoplights not going you know, my direction while they are green for other people? Or hating the rain as it ruins my picnic, but the gardeners are celebrating or being upset about having too much snow while those who are skiing are happy. Well, and on and on, every day, sitting in judgment of the Creator because I could do better, at least for me. So, what was the disciples and the ancient Israelites' real complaint? They wanted a world that conformed to their own desires, a world where the wind obeyed them, a world of their own making, not the world that God made. By being angry at the wind, each disciple said, um, Well, I'm not God, but I want to be. Is this not the root of so much uh, human happiness? The desire, you know, to make God's world into our own image. Misdirected, God-like desires that are impossible for human beings to fulfill can take up resonance in our flesh and give us nothing but misery. The mythic snake continues to tell the same old lie he told to Eve. Eat of the fruit. Well, and you'll be like God. Believing this, the disciples wanted their own wind, and they were robbed of any pleasure God's world could give them. The result of all this is that the disciples failed to recognize Jesus when he came to them in their unhappiness. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So how does Jesus' teaching free us from the unhappiness that comes from bad desires driven by that demonic lie? Jesus says the hungry, well, there are the ones who are blessed. God is found in the experience of limit, in the laws, in the physical nature of the body, in the emptiness, in the hunger, and in the thirst. In the experience of personal insufficiency that we all do so much to avoid, 
there is the possibility of a sufficiency greater than our own, a divine fullness. The problem with human fullness of any kind is that it very easily leads us to become full of ourselves. And when we are full of ourselves and our pride, it is hard to recognize God and too easy to spend our lives striving to force the world to conform to our desires. Jesus says, accept your hunger, embrace the limited life given you by God, even if it is brief, you know, give up the fruitless wish to be God. Once this damning wish is uh, renounced, all our life can be received as a daily gift of God, like manna in the wilderness. The daily struggle to live is no longer a curse, but a continual reminder that we are not God, and that God is God. Instead of judging God for my hunger problem, that very problem should prompt me to worship. In this way, our hunger teaches us about our finitude and creates space for the infinite God. Only when we give up the quest to be God are we free to be ourselves, as we truly are for the very first time. After Jesus taught this, he gave the crowds a miraculous meal. He gave them bread for one evening. Note that he did not cure them of their hunger forever. This would not have been a more difficult miracle. He gave them some food, but they were all hungry again in the morning, just as the ancient Israelites who ate the miraculous manna every morning because it was, well, only enough food for one day. To cure them of their hunger would have been to curse them, for then he would have made it even more difficult to discover the happiness that comes being one of God's creatures. This is why Jesus said, Woe to those who are full now. Nothing exemplifies this teaching of Jesus more than his own cross. The cross stands as the very limit of human possibility. It seems to me that a man nailed to a cross has no illusions about trying to make the world into his own image, that is, about being God. The struggle is only to breathe. But it is there on the cross of Christ that the fullness of God dwells, and only there is the new life of the resurrection found. But are we able to recognize Christ when he comes to us in this way? When Jesus comes to us on a cross, in our hungry, in inconvenient things, in the struggle. With this teaching, and with a divine presence that revealed both the fullness of God and the limits of human beings, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We are told that people responded, Sir, give us this bread always. May that be our response too. Give us this bread, always. If that is the case, then we may discover that some of the very things we spent so much time complaining about were the very clues to life's meaning. But I pray that it doesn't take us, you know, so long to discover this, so that each one of us can be unburdened of our own judgments and praise God, whose splendor always excels even our most noble aspirations. Amen. Please join as we reaffirm our faith by saying together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form five. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming. We pray to you, O Lord. In the Anglican communion, we pray for the Scottish Episcopal Church. In our diocese, we pray for Church of the Good Shepherd Reading, for St. John's Church, Saugust, Emmanuel Church, Wakefield, the Third Order Society of St. Francis. We also pray for the faith communities in Chelmsford, especially for Central Congregational Church. And we pray for those joining God's mission in our parish, especially for the Acolytes. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Alan and Gail, our bishops, for Paul, our interim rector, for Valerie, deacon, and for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one, as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those in the armed forces and their families, especially for those who have been deployed overseas, and for all others serving our country for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray to you, O Lord. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joe, our president, and Charlie, our governor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. For a blessing upon all human labor, and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord. We pray for those in our parish in need of healing, for Al, Molly, Nate, and Garrett. We pray for family and friends of our parishioners, for Lily, Dave, and family, Penny, John Stewart and family, Chris, and Dan. And we pray for those who are at home, in nursing homes, or living with chronic illnesses. For Terry, Chaz, Larry, and Ken. For Catherine, Garrett, and Ginny. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer. For refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger. That they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. For this congregation, that we may deliver it from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O Lord. For ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives, we pray to you, O Lord. For all who have commended our, themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being free from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. We pray to you, O Lord. For the prayers that are in our hearts and those not yet formed, we pray to you, O Lord. For all who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place 
where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, our fast from Holy Communion does not arise out of any lack of devotion to you, but out of the love you have commanded that we have for one another. Give us strength to endure and bless this fast so that our spiritual hunger will lead us to worship you as one family, once again gathered around your altar, where with your Son, Jesus Christ, you live and reign with the Holy Spirit, one God, unto ages of ages. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.